so this is the my disclosure and I will start with the cancer, uh, world cancer statistics. And so you can see this is a quite old slide, um, incidence and mortality 2008, projected uh, incidence and mortality in 2030. But I just want to make a point here. So the, the column to the left, very far left, is the incidence of OGI malignancies. Um, green part is liver, so usually primary liver cancer and intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. The color next to it is mortality. And so the incidence goes up and also is the mortality. That's the projected rate of incidence. So uh, I want to uh, focus my talk on uh, update in systemic therapy for biliary cancer. I start with that. Then, uh, then followed by a systemic therapy update on hepatic biliary cancer. I will talk a little more about the importance of multidisciplinary care for patients with hepatic biliary cancer. So here, this is a simple cartoon shows uh, the biliary tract. Patients with uh, cancer in the red part, those are intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma before the bifurcation. The green part is uh, patients with cancer developed in the green part is uh, perihilar cholangiocarcinoma, and the yellow portion is distal, distal extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And uh, cholangiocarcinoma is very heterogeneous, and the incidence of genetic alteration differs by primary tumor location. So I give you an example. And uh, so for example, FGF1 to three fusion mutation and amplification occurs in 11 to 45 percent of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, only 3% in, uh, uh, in gallbladder cancer. And patients with a genetic alteration, FGF2 fusion, there's an effective therapy uh, that for those patients. And IDH1 mutation, I give you another example. And so 4.9 to 36% of uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma carry IDH1 to 2 mutation. Currently, there's an FDA-approved treatment uh, four patients carry this mutation, biliary tract cancer. The other example I want to make is gall, in gallbladder cancer, 9.8 to 19% of patients with HER2 amplification, so which connect them to a anti-HER2 therapy. So now um, let's move to um, the standard chemotherapy. About more than 10 years ago now, and a ran global randomized phase three study uh, established the combination of cisplatin and gemcitabine as the frontline therapy based on ABCO2 study. Uh, so this, uh, this um, study compared the combination of gemcis to the standard of care gemcitabine, improved over survival from 8.3 months to 11.7 months. So gem gemcitabine cisplatin is giving as an intravenous infusion weekly, two weeks on, one week off, every three week cycle. And that becomes a standard care for 10 years until recently, we have finally have a global phase three study has met its primary endpoint. This is a, the Topaz-1 study evaluated the combination of immunotherapy, the Viomap plus gemsis in comparison with standard care gemsis in patients with advanced biliary tract cancer. The primary endpoint uh, pro pro objective is over survival. So patients are randomized to Devayomab or placebo plus gemsis for eight cycles, which is six months of chemo, followed by Devayomab or, uh, or placebo as a maintenance therapy until disease progression or intolerable toxicities. Uh, studies stratified for disease status, initially unresectable versus recurrent post-resection, or primary tumor location. So this study showed a improved over survival from 11.5 months to 12.8 months with a hazard ratio of 0 0.8, favored the, the combination of the Viomap plus GEMSYS. So you all know that the, the survival curve tends to separate late uh, when uh, we test a combination of immunotherapy with chemotherapy. So um, the a piecewise um, um, hazard ratio was calculated to reflect that. So the hazard ratio before six months, zero to six months was 0 0.91, and post six months becomes 0 0.74. So um, I'd uh, suggest a long-term benefit with this combination. 
and the combination of the value map plus GEMSYS was quite well tolerated. Currently, the combination has made it to NCCN guideline. The data is under review by FDA for approval. So other chemotherapy combination. And so uh, we have a triplets, which is a Braxin plus GEMSYS. And this is uh, data from a phase two study uh, of 60 patients. And uh, so patients receive triplets chemotherapy. Uh, this study has achieved a median over survival of 19 months and with a very promising objective rate uh, response rate of 45 percent disease control rate of 82 84 percent of course this is data from a smaller study currently the regimen is being evaluated in comparison with gemsys in a phase three uh, larger study and i usually would uh, consider this three drug combination for young robust patients if I really want to get make get this patients from borderline resectable to resectable um, and get a breach uh, breach these patients for resection and of course this is at the cost of toxicity uh, grade three four toxicity occurred in more than half of the patients and uh, other combination chemotherapy and so in the second line setting in patients who have progressed on GEMSYS and Forfox, uh, which is what we use often for colorectal cancer, was tested in the second line setting for treatment of biliary tract cancer based on ABC06 study. This is a UK study. This study showed improvement of median over survival. And, uh, and you can see if you get the number and this, the benefits is quite modest. Another combination that has uh, shown promising result, this is a randomized phase two study evaluating the um, NAP arenotecan plus 5-FU leucovorin in comparison with 5-FU leucovorin, which showed improvement in PFS and OS based on a NIFG study occurred in South Korea. Currently, we we're testing this combination as a single arm study a IIT multi-center study led by Dr. Benjamin Weinberg um, uh, and uh, testing this combination in Western population. So the study is ongoing. So now um, we've talked about chemotherapy or chemoimmunotherapy combination. So I want to spend a little more time on uh, personalized medicine in biliary cancer. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, 40 to 50 percent of biliary tract cancer have targetable mutation, which emphasize the importance of biopsy and tumor profile in those patients. So start with FGFR signaling. FGFR signaling is very important in many types of cancer, including biliary cancer. And in biliary cancer, uh, you can observe um, FGFR increase of the protein expression, uh, mutation of the receptor, and amplification of the gene or fusion of the gene uh, with another gene. So uh, it is a common mutation found in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So I need to move this box so I can see um, the numbers on the slides. So you can see the incidence differs by tumor, primary tumor location. 11 to 15 percent in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma drops to 3 percent in gallbladder cancer. Currently, there are many uh, FGF inhibitors are being tested in biliary tract cancer um, that carry uh, in those patients carry this uh, genetic alterations. We have two FDA approved treatment, infogratinib and pemigatinib, or recently approved one 2020, the other 2021, and uh, with a promising response rate as high as 35 percent, a median over survival. Uh, in the range of uh, more than 21 months, phase three study uh, testing the, the the drug in combination with chemo in the frontline setting, and those two FDA approved therapy are reversible FGFR inhibitor binds to the ATPase pocket, and a very promising compound is called fatty uh, fatty uh, fatipatinib, which is a irreversible inhibitor to FAG, FGFR receptor, which showed a very promising results presented uh, last year and with a response rate of 42% and median over survival of 21.7 months. Additional FGFR inhibitors are being evaluated. 
And um, so it is a very exciting time for patients who carry FGFR2 fusion in their biliary tract cancer. Another very important target is IDH1 mutation. This mutation is found in biliary in 20 to 25% of intrahepatic biliary cancer and 0 to 7.4% 7 7 in extrahepatic biliary cancer. And so um, this the mutation result in increase in oncometabolites that uh, um, stimulate proliferation of biliary tract uh, uh, cancer. Um, this mutation is also very important in, uh, in uh, uh, glioma. So um, you can see there's an improved improvement in median over survival in patients treated with a hazard ratio of 0 0.79. But if you adjust for the crossover, because all those patients receive placebo, if they are in the shape to crossover at the time of progression, they all received a versitinib. And so the, has, the adjusted hazard ratio is very promising, 0.49%. So the avacitinib is currently FDA approved for biliary tract cancer with IDH1 mutation. So it is important to test those patients for this mutation. Other, tree, other uh, targets, it's a very important target is HER2 gene um, amplification or overexpression. And you can see about 30% of gallbladder cancer uh, has increased expression of HER2 and dropped to 10 to 20% in extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and 5% to intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma. Currently, the dual anti HER2 therapy, pertuzumab uh, plus tra transtuzumab, were tested in a small study, showed promising results with a response rate of 23% and median over survival of 10.9 months in heavily treated biliary tract cancer. Recently, data on T, uh, TXD, um, TDXT, which is a um, antibody drug conjugate. So a trastuzumab plus with the chemo combination, and uh, it's, the, this, uh, the, it's made, this, uh, made this drug. And um, th this was tested in a very small uh, data set and very interestingly showed a response rate of 36.4% in HER2 positive patients by the, by the traditional um, standard, which is uh, three plus uh, HER2 uh, expression or um, HER2 amplification. And with a median survival of uh, 7.1 months in heavily treated patients, very interestingly, uh, patients with low HER2 expression has also shown benefit. So it seems that with this antibody drug conjugate, we don't need as many copies of HER2 on the cell surface to, pr to provide benefit with this kind of therapy. And drugs targeting HER2, it's a very hot area. We know this is a very important drug target in breast cancer and stomach cancer. So there are many uh, drugs are being evaluated uh, targeting HER2, including the, uh, the antibody, the drug conjugates, inhibitors. So there, there's more exciting data um, up, like in the horizon in testing this target. Another very interesting target is, is the um, BRAF mutation. Um, uh, and so this specific mutation is a driving mutation it is important in uh, has shown very promising results in melanoma and also colorectal cancer and so um, in this basket trial a cohort with biliary tract cancer was tr treated with the BRAF inhibitor plus MEK inhibitor you can see showed very promising results of response rate of um of 22 percent so this is a water fall curve very familiar to all the oncologists i want to explain it to uh, to, to the audience. So the, the, coin, the, the column represents the change of the tumor size. So you can see below zero is tumor shrinkage. And this dotted line shows you the minus 30% tumor shrinkage. It's, uh, if patient has 30% or more tumor shrinkage and patient is uh, it's, uh, considered a partial response, so you can see there's a lot of patients with partial response and also a lot of more patients with some minor tumor shrinkage. And this study, uh, this 
heavily treated population and have shown the very promising median over survival of 14 months. Um, another very important mutation is mismatch repair deficiency. So uh, this uh, occurs only in three to 10% of BD retract cancer. And so the mismatch repair deficiency result in an uh, increase of uh, mutations in the tumor that result in the higher load of tumor antigen. That's at least what we think the reason why it's um, those patients tend to respond to immune checkpoint inhibitor. So there are two study evaluate immune checkpoint inhibitors in patients with mismatch repair deficiency show the response rate of 40, 53% and a complete response rate, the tumor disappeared in 21% of patients with very uh, good uh, over survival, two year over survival, 64%. So, so this is a screen, um, uh, so the, the screenshot of the NCCN guideline to show you the ever increasing list of treatment options for patients with biliary tract cancer. The top part shows the frontline therapy, GEMSYS, there are many other regimen. The, uh, the Valumab immunotherapy plus GEMSYS is among the list of options. And the triplets is also among the list of options. In the second line setting, we talked about the Forfox, liposomal arena t plus 5 if you look Warren. And also there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, therapeutic options targeting different genetic alterations that can be considered for patients with biliary tract cancer if they carry those mutations. So this slide show you the, pre the, 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 the improvement progress we've made in precision oncology for biliary tract cancer since 2017. So um, this really um, emphasized the importance of tumor profile. So summary, chemotherapy is the standard of care uh, for advanced biliary tract cancer. Uh, first line therapy uh, started from gem cysts. There are many treatment options in the frontline setting. Topaz study demonstrated addition of immune checkpoint inhibitor devalumab to gem cysts was associated with improved clinical benefit in patients with advanced biliary tract cancer. Forfox showed survive, uh, survival benefit in the second line setting. In a randomized phase three study, although the benefit is modest, uh, now Arena TCAN uh, showed survival benefit in second line setting in a randomized phase three study. We continue to test this combination in the Western population. All patients who will receive systemic therapy should be profiled uh, with a comprehensive, comprehensive genetic testing of the tumor inhibitors targeting FGFR2. IGF-1 or 2, HER2, BRAF, uh, V600E mutations have shown improved clinical outcome of patients with biliary tract cancer with those corresponding genetic alterations. What's in the horizon? So uh, we are trying to end testing additional uh, combination immunotherapy in biliary tract cancer. We are also testing more, testing more therapeutic targets uh, in addition, you know, we it's very difficult to get a lot of tissue for profiling, and uh, so um, we are developing the sort of testing liquid biopsy. And uh, currently, a lipid, uh, using liquid biopsy to detect all the genetic alterations, uh, it's still um, as under research. And I, I think we the improvement needs to, still needs to be made to uh, uh, find those mutations in the blood. So now I'm going to jump quickly to HCC. So this is another sort of history of treatment landscaping HCC. Before to, uh, 2007, we had the first FDA approved drug is sorafenib. A lot of us don't like sorafenib because of its modest survival benefit and toxicity profile. And for 10 years, we did like we participate in many over a dozen randomized phase three studies that all leads to a negative um, uh, primary endpoint until 2007. In 2017, there is a booming of um, uh, treatment gets approved 
for advanced stage HCC, now we have eight FDA approved treatments. There are more uh, combinations are being evaluated. The trials have been completed. We are uh, pending re uh, reading read of the final data. So I want to uh, show you, uh, so the whole eight treatments, they are um, divided into two main class, immunotherapy and tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So immunotherapy, um, I give you a little um, uh, sort of summary here. So the PD-1, PD-L1 uh, interaction, which is a normal mechanism, is exists in our body to prevent rejection and prevent, um, uh, it's also important a mechanism to prevent autoimmune disease. And so cancer actually take advantage of this mechanism to defend themselves from an attack by immunity. So uh, cancer cells obviously look very different from us, from the normal cells. Usually before this happens, our immunity is able to actually attack those cancer cells until the cancer figured out a way to defend themselves. We call it immune breaks. This is one of many immune breaks used by cancer cells and the two scientists discovered among uh, with two of the, the two scientists uh, were among many scientists worked on this won Nobel Prize for this discovery because of the discovery and which lead to the FDA approval of a whole class of treatment targeting this target. Basically, the drug will break the interaction and activate the, your immunity to sort of so your immunity will attack the cancer. And if the cancer use this as a main immune break, of course, if the cancer do not, cancer cells do not use this immune break, use other immune break, then this treatment may not work. So, um, so currently uh, we have nivolumab, pembrolizumab, bevacizumab, and etuzolizumab combination are FDA approved. The valumab and trimenumumab are under review by FDA for approval. So tyrosine kinase inhibitors so currently we have two tyrosine kinase inhibitors targeting uh, VEGF, PDGF, FGF are many uh, pathways that involved in angiogenesis and cell proliferation. So we have sorafenib, regorafenib, levatinib, carbozantinib. So frontline therapy, I'll make it brief. So sorafenib, uh, so the so was approved based on the sharp trial, which is a randomized global phase three study, led to the improvement of seven uh, of over survival from 7.9 months to 10 months uh, compared to placebo. That was the first systemic therapy approved and in 2007. So that we use that only systemic therapy for 10 years. And 10 years later, there was a study and um, a reflex study that evaluate levatinib in comparison with serafinib, the study had the two layer design, superiority design and non-inferiority design. The study did not make the primary endpoint for superiority, but made the point for non-inferiority. So uh, levatinib has produced a as good survival as serafinib. But the benefit of the Vantanib has reflected on improved secondary endpoint with a overall response rate by modified races of 41% and doubled uh, the, the pro uh, progression free survival. So um, it, it got FDA approval in 2018. So um, the uh, so we actually uh, Lombardi Cancer Center investigators at the Lombardi Cancer Center we are uh, we participate in the initial uh, testing of bevacizumab and tuzolizumab as a phase one study uh, in HCC it was a three cohort study there are two other cohorts one in gastric cancer one in pancreas cancer so that study um, so I actually witnessed the the promising results with, of this combination uh, in advanced HCC, those promising results lead to the, um, the, the global IBRIN 150 study. And so that has really, I, in my opinion, changed, the, changed how we think about treatment for HCC. Uh, so the, the, the combination of bevacizumab and tuzuluzumab improved median over survival from 13.4 months to 19.2 months, a big jump. And we also see an improved 
uh, over survival, uh, median uh, progression-free survival rate. This study has a dual primary endpoint, PFS and OS. It made both, met both endpoints. I also want to point out to you that in patients who, who receive the combination therapy, you can see this plateau of the tail and uh, the, the tail part of the curve suggest some some of the patients really have uh, are able to survive for quite a long time to obtain very uh, durable response to this treatment. So another combination, so this, the previous combination I mentioned is bevacizumab, which is anti-VEGF antibody, plus tizuizumab, which is a anti pdl one antibody. So uh, bevacizumab, as you all are well, and there's always a concern for bleeding because it's a mono-antibody uh, targeting VEGF. So patients who receive immun, uh, this combination, if they have cirrhosis, they all need to have a endoscopy at least within six months from start of the therapy to rule out those patients to to sort of who has severe uh, varices. And because um, if they have severe varices, and those those patients can bleed, and so we do not uh, want to put those patients, even they get uh, a banding and the scleral, uh, the 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 bandit varices can also bleed so we um i think the uh, group of researchers in our transplant team and they're working on a a non-invasive methods use image criteria to try to identify those patients um who uh, may at the risk of bleeding with uh, with this combination so hopefully we don't have to at one point we don't always have to use EGD as a screening tool. So this combination, which is a dual IO combination, immune checkpoint combination, so there's no anti-VEGF inhibitor involved. So map is an anti-CTLA-4 inhibitor, and uh, the Valumab is anti pd l one antibody. And so this combination has, a, so this study has made the primary endpoint. We also participated in this study and you can see um, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.78 and um, and then the, the curve separate relatively early and remain separate. And currently the data is under review by FDA. So the benchmark for first line systemic therapy in advanced HCC, which now is the standard. And if we want to develop additional, more effective combination, and we have to beat this. Response rate more than 30%. Median over survival more than 19 months for advanced HCC, three year survival rate over 30%. Subsequent line therapy for HCC. And so, um, so we started with TKI, and, and here are the two TKI regorafenib and carbozantinib. Both are FDA approved in patients who progressed on sorafenib. And both achieved a very similar median over survival over 10 months from placebo around seven to eight months. One approved 2017, the other approved 2019. One thing I pointed out is if um, the survival was significantly improved with sequential therapy with uh, sorafenib um, followed by regorafenib in this study, and the median over survival was as high as 26 months in patients with advanced HCC what after, so if they receive sorafenib followed by regorafenib, of course, this is sort of a, uh, a, a analysis from a clinic trial. And with uh, this is not the primary study endpoint, but th that can tell you that in a subselect, in a selected group of patients who may really, who can tolerate TKI and may really benefit TKI with very improved um, survival outcome. I want to show you this phase one study. We also participate as one of the site. And this study, I, in my opinion, is a very product, productive phase one study. Initially, when the study was presented to IRB, CRC and IRB, I, we, I have to defend the study because this is not a typical phase one study. It, it has many cohorts and also it has, in some cohorts, it enrolls a lot of patients. So I want to tell you this is very productive for the following reason. The initial 
cohort that uh, that from 48 patients expanded to more than 200 patients, those data actually led to the FDA approval of nivolumab from this phase one, two study. Later, a, a, what nivolumab, which is an anti-PD-1 therapy, was tested in patients with impaired liver function, child pure B liver function, and that showed benefit. So from that cohort, this nivolumab made it to the NCCN guideline for child pure B patients. Then the co cohort four, which tests the combination of anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4, nivolumab plus ibilumumab, and led to the accelerated approval for uh, by FDA using this combination in second line setting, and be, and this made it to the NCCN guideline. Also, this promising data led to the the study, the frontline study, Checkmate 90W, testing this combination in the first line setting. That uh, currently the study has finished enrollment, pending data uh, review. And the six cohort test the combination of nivolumab, ibilumumab plus a TKI that also showed very interesting results. Um, but this, um, this combination was not developed in the phase three setting because of its toxicity. So nivolumab, um, uh, single agent anti-PD-1 therapy is able to re result in a response rate 15 to 20%, very durable response. And the median duration of response was 16.6 .6 months. So patients uh, uh, enrolled in that study, some of the patients enrolled in the study since 2000, uh, like in 2015, still in remission. So we have seen some complete responders in this, in, in, the, in this uh, patients enrolled in the initial phase one study. However, when this uh, drug was tested in phase three study, it did not meet the primary over survival benefit, it's um, it's we're able to see the response rate in that larger study, but we're not able to see the improvement of median over survival in the whole population. So, um, so pembrolizumab is the other anti PD one antibody from Merck, and was tested in second line setting uh, for HCC, showed a similar response rate. And the study, uh, the drug was tested um, in two randomized phase three study in the second line setting. Keynote 240 was not, did not meet the primary endpoint. The study carried out in Asia met uh, nine, uh, I think Keynote uh, 394 met the primary endpoint. Currently, it's still one of the second line treatment options for HCC. So now I want to tell you that the, 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 the story of nivolumab plus ipilumumab uh, from that cohort four of Checkmate 9040 that lead to FDA approval. So this, there, this cohort test different combination of nivolumab and ipilumumab and with different dosing. And there's three cohort, one cohort, uh, the, the data was so promising led to the approval. So this cohort, uh, uh, patients enrolled in this cohort received nivolumab one milligram per kilo plus ipilumumab three milligram per kilo every four weeks, every three weeks for four cycles, followed by nivolumab monthly maintenance treatment. The median over survival was in the second line setting reached 22.8 uh, months. And, um, and the response rate was 32%. There's an eight percent uh, complete response rate. So another thing I want to point out here is you, you can see this Kepler Mayo curve is breaked into three curves based on patient's response. The red one is patients had PR or CR, thirty percent or more tumor shrink shrinkage or complete tumor disappearance, and so you can see a lot of those patients have survived for a long time, and the the black curve is the patients who progress and they have uh, a much shorter median over survival. Patients who had minor tumor shrinkage or stable disease still have improved median over survival, although not as good as in patients who had a partial response. So prog progress made for uh, advanced HCC. And so I just summarized, took all this data and summarized it. So now we have eight FDA-approved systemic therapy 
we are able to improve response rate with some systemic therapy in advanced HCC. So from the TKI modified resist response rate, 44% based on the tri reflect trial, phase three trial, response rate, uh, which uh, is for resist criteria is 29.8% with a complete response rate. Uh, so so this, for, for the combination of bevacizumab and tuzulizumab, the response rate was close to 30% with a complete response rate close to 8%. And uh, RISIS 1.1 Evolumab plus Ipilumumab, and the response rate was 32%, and uh, the complete response rate was 8%, which achieved, um, so the survival benefit, survival, there's a over survival improvement. So from the frontline study, bevacizumab atezolizumab resulted in, in a median over survival of 19.2 months. And ipilumumab ipil, uh, and nivolumab, and in a second line setting, a smaller study, which is the, the cohort from phase one to study, resulted in a median over survival of 22 months. If you look at the sequential therapy for TKI, the median over survival was as was longer than two years. And an, another point I want to point out, durable response to immunotherapy to uh, leads to prolonged survival in patients who have shown a response to immunotherapy. I want to use this uh, kaplan myo curve uh, as an example, so which I've shown you earlier. So I think we, when um, before uh, 2017, we always talk with patients about sorafenib treatment. So you can see we've made a lot of increment improvement in HCC treatment. I think now we are talking about 100 meter dash now to try to um, achieve marathon, like running a marathon with multiple lines of therapy, many options. So there are still a lot of interesting combinations of being evaluated at the Lombardi Cancer Center. We always have frontline study. We have also have um, um, second line studies. Now we're moving combination uh, immunotherapy in the in, in the median stage cancer. We have a we have two study uh, in collaboration with our interventional radiologist. Um, uh, Dr. Phil Benevec's team and uh, Nori uh, Tabari at the hospital center of testing combination immunotherapy in intermediate stage HCC. And uh, there are some adjuvant study that have uh, we've uh, completed uh, at will one of the site um, that uh, we're waiting for the data to mature. So there's many other emerging studies. And so those are the three studies that have complete enrollment. We participate as investigators and we're watching for the results uh, to come out. So we can have more additional options um, uh, for, for patients with advanced HCC. So now I'm gonna change gear a little bit, spend a few minutes to talk about multidisciplinary care. And this is a true disease killed by a team of doctors. So people from the diagnosis, even from patients with risk factors and to diagnose surveillance diagnosis, then treatment at different stages. And we collaborate tightly. So we medical oncologists, surgical oncologists, our transplant team, GI team, and radiation oncologist, interventional radiolo radiologist, and we cannot really provide very good care without the, out the input of our superb radiologist who really can give us a lot of information about uh, the, the, the tumor and also the anatomy and the underlying disease. And we have a very active pathology service and uh, nutritionist, social worker, primary care, we all work very closely together to provide care from the very beginning all the way to supportive care towards end of life. So one more slide I want to show you. And so this is sort of a modified uh, BCLC staging, use a cartoon. And I think the BCLC staging is being modified because of the booming of 
uh, treatment options. So for early stage HCC resection transplant are the main treatment. IR provide ablation and medical oncologists, we try to improve the outcome by providing, hopefully in the future, we're gonna have uh, adjuvant therapy. We also are using circulating DNA, try to follow those patients who have high risk for recurrence. So we're, we're testing a lot of new technologies and we are also trying to evaluate new therapy in that, uh, in that group of patients. Currently, there's no adjuvant therapy for those patients yet. For intermediate stage HCC, our interventional radiologists always try to um, provide liver target therapy to downstage patients, bridge patient to transplant. And uh, we are now medical oncology IR, we are collaborating and try to uh, improve the outcome of patients with intermediate stage HCC, combining systemic therapy with liver target therapy, TASE or radio embolization. Medical oncology collaborate with transplant, try to develop a protocol and will uh, testing um, will enroll patients who had immunotherapy, great response of immunotherapy for some time. And we wanted to provide a transplant option for those patients that will be, um, that will be done as a protocol. I, uh, I think our transplant team is developing that protocol right now. For the advanced stage HCC, now we have expanding options of systemic therapy and there are other exciting stuff are ongoing such as uh, cellular therapy so for patients who have refractory disease to treatment we have we want to overcome the primary resistance and make those people live longer so it is a very exciting time and because there are so much new options and uh, and new therapy are being tested in hepatic B cancer. 